Good afternoon and welcome to the 157th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we'll talk about life in COVID-19 quarantine with Aram Jong, Yansil Kang, and Hilda Vandenbroek. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests, future topics, please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 27th, 2020, there are 1,162,512 deaths from COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 8,735,312 cases of COVID-19 in the United States. That's up from 8,669,894 reported yesterday. There are now a total of 226,171 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19, up from 225,434 reported yesterday. As a way to bring humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. Headline is Eulogy for a Beloved Father Who Died Alone in the Era of COVID-19 by Nathan M. Greenfield. I'm going to read an excerpt of this quite extraordinary obituary that was published in the Times of San Diego, August 26th, and I'll post the full link to it on Twitter later. You may want to read the whole thing. It's really remarkable. My father would have preferred to have died a day earlier, dying on April Fool's Day, the man who spent two thirds of his 91 years as a novelist and playwright would have told me is trite or so ironic that it weighs down the story. It's like having a character die on All Souls Night or Passover. He would, however, have rather liked the turn of the narrative screw that had his heart give out during a coughing fit 15 minutes after reaching a room following 45 hours in the ER of a COVID-ridden hospital on Staten Island, New York. He had been taken there with difficulty breathing caused by simple pneumonia. I, his only living child, was told numerous times on the phone by harried nursing station staff. Though irreligious, indeed militantly atheist, my family fairly collected religious friends, a habit I have continued. He, my father, knew that many of the men he respected and loved would have coped with the white terror of the ER, amplified by the dirge around him, by preparing their souls for what they feared or hoped would come. What then did pass through his mind during those last few dozen hours? I'm sure he wanted to hear my voice calling from Ottawa, on the other side of the closed US-Canadian border. He worried about my stroke-weakened 91-year-old mother at the retirement home, though I'm certain he was buoyed by the knowledge that Chano, who gives exemplary care, was with my mother 24-7. Unbidden would have come memories of the endless hours he'd spent in hospitals in the late 1950s and early 1960s, when one after another, my father, my mother's father, his father, my mother's favorite uncles, and his sister sickened and died. Memories that made even going to the medical clinic for routine matters a special kind of torment. Had I been able to visit him while he was in ER, and had he been strong enough, it's pleasant to think that I'd have found him wondering how he would dramatize the world around him. The old game of what if, which we played on the long car rides back to Brooklyn from Sag Harbor, near the tip of Long Island or Cape Cod, now morphed into wondering about the relationship between the old woman on the other side of the curtain and her son, whom she heard arguing on what he assumed was her cell phone. How did the young South Asian female doctor, for instance, who prescribed his penicillin drip end up in a Staten Island hospital? Perhaps her father had been an immigrant who settled on the island because he could have a larger backyard in which to grow vegetables. 
an idea that came to him because after noting his chart, told him that he had to eat the vegetables at lunch and dinner, even though they were rather mushy. Did the Hispanic orderly live on Staten Island or did he have to risk traveling from Brooklyn or Queens to get to work? However good the care he received in the ER, no one in the family doubted that he hoped to be among those non-COVID patients slated to be moved to the USNS Comfort, the hospital ship moored in the Hudson River, two piers over from where the SS Normandy capsized after a fire in February 1942, a site he described many times, always in the same reverent tone. Though it shares next to nothing with the Pequot, the whaler Herman Melville's Ishmael ships out on in Moby Dick, the thought of being on the comfort would have prompted my father to immerse himself in what he remembered of his favorite novel. Though Melville's quarrel with God interested him, it would not have helped answer the question Melville himself pondered, why would a just and merciful God allow such suffering? Instead, my father would have imagined himself hovering close to Ishmael, reveling in his description the sights and sounds of unfurling sails, feeling his mind the smells of the ship and scents of the sea. Joining in the excitement of the hunt for Moby Dick, the harpooning of the great white whale, Melville's supreme achievement, he believed in the one he could have experienced a simulacrum of on the comfort as it rose and fell with the tides. That was the evocation of the feel of a ship under sail. My father's heart stopped at 5.09 p.m. on April 1st, 2020, the 21st day of the COVID-19 pandemic. He deserved to experience those moments after the code blue was sounded not as white hot terror, but rather as a storyline that pleasantly led him into the night. Okay, let's turn to our conversation for today. Pleased to have three wonderful guests to talk about quarantine. Let me introduce them. Aram Zhang is an assistant professor in humanities at Sichuan University Pittsburgh Institute in Chengdu, China, where she teaches English composition, K-pop, Korean film, and new media. Her research takes a transnational approach to Korean and Korean American film, literature, theater, and performance, and her current book project, Beyond the Sewol, performing transnational acts of activism in South Korea and the diaspora explores how performance documents death, loss, and memory in South Korea and diasporic communities. I cannot wait for that book. Yan Sil Kang is, a currently, is currently a visiting assistant professor at Drexel University's History Department. She's interested in understanding the intersections of the environment, science and technology, and disasters, especially in East Asia. She's working on a project, another book I cannot wait for, Mineral Time, Bodily Time, Asbestos, Slow Disaster, and Toxic Politics in South Korea, which explores the history and politics of asbestos, the environmental hazard that shaped environmental health policies in South Korea. My third guest is Hilda von den Buch. She's a professor of communication studies and head of the Department of Communication at Drexel University. She recently completed a project on the privacy and trust implications of the use of third-party trackers on platforms of public and commercial media, and is currently analyzing the role of PBS as most trusted U.S. institution in a post-trust, post-truth era. In the field of media culture, she studies the role of mediated communication in celebrity culture with a focus on celebrity activism. Together with Drexel professor Alexander Jenkins, she's currently analyzing the role of different media in the activism of sports celebrities, comparing the cases of Smith and Carlos 1968 Black Power with Colin Kaepernick's Black Lives Matter work. Welcome, Aram, Yansel, and Hilda. Thank you for making time to come on COVID Calls today. Happy to be here. Pleased to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Scott. So I'd like to start the way I usually do, just to find out where you're calling in from. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation is looking like there today. Yansil, can I start with you, please? Sure. Uh, so I'm calling in from Center City, Philadelphia, and I think we have 340 confirmed cases today, uh, October 27th. And that makes total uh, 42,924 42, cases uh, since the day the first uh, case in Philadelphia. It seems like uh, uh, 
has been increasing trend. Uh, and since I'm going to talk about South Korea today, I brought some statistics there uh, just to have a comparison. So the total confirmed case since day one in January is 26,043 people and total death is 460. And uh, 1,600 uh, people are under quarantine currently uh, as of today. And that makes total 23,980 people uh, that experienced total uh, so far. So today, uh, October 27th, 80, 80 new cases, 88 new cases were confirmed. Um, one of the trends I'd like to mention is that there has been uh, changing centers of outbreaks, but uh, recently it is concerning trend that nursing uh, homes and care facilities has becoming the uh, major centers of outbreak and hospitals as well. So that kind of uh, worries me personally. Uh, about the uh, overturn of the pandemic. Yansel, you were a guest on COVID calls on April 6th. Yes. I, just went, I went back and looked. Yes. It seems like in COVID time, a decade has passed yes. since then. And the death toll in the United States is so much remarkably higher mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. then. I did not expect it would last this long uh, at this strength. Uh, so that makes me uh, very grim that it has been already, what, six months since then or about? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll look forward to finding out about your quarantine experience in South Korea. Thank you for that uh, orientation. And Aram, can I turn to you, please? Where are you calling from and how's it looking there? Hi, um, I'm currently in Chengdu, which is in Sichuan province, China. Um, so here, um, at least in Chengdu, uh, the Chinese government has imposed very strict measures to control the pandemic for several months. And so due to those restrictions, life is actually uh, almost back to normal in Chengdu. I go to the classroom, I teach, I go to the shopping malls, I even see uh, swimming pools and pool parties open. Um, people still do have to wear masks when they board on like public transportation, like buses and subways. But other than that, um, yeah, life is slowly returning to normal. And we have not, at least in Chengdu, we have not seen any COVID cases for about several weeks. And so what's the situation on campus then? Um, students... Most students don't wear masks. I, I still wear a mask just to practice mm -hmm. safety. But now, you know, you can just go to the cafeteria. There are, they don't practice social distancing anymore because uh, everything is considerably safer, much, much safer now. Um, there used to be a time when you had to show uh, a QR code with that shows your health report. I'm not sure if this shows up on mm -hmm. your phone when you enter public venues, like like restaurants or shopping malls. But now um, they don't even ask you to do that anymore. So I would say the situation, uh, at least where I'm living in, in Chengdu, is, is considerably a lot safer than it was you know, earlier this year. Well, we'll talk about that in some detail. Are you still expected to fill out a daily health report and, and upload that and make that available to public health authorities or not at this time? Uh, yes, uh, my HR staff still requires the faculty to upload them, you know, at least by text message that we're okay and, you know, my temperature is like 36 degrees or something. So we're still required to do that just as safety precautions. That's, uh, even in the United States and only very few places have moved into that in, in the school's environment. And we're so many, many months beyond when you started doing that in China. Amazing. Uh, Aram, thank you for that introduction. Hilda, let me turn to you. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm talking to you from uh, New York, where I live and where I arrived back from Belgium last Friday. So I just spent a couple of weeks in uh, Belgium and I've just told the sheriff of New York that I am indeed staying indoors for two weeks, the quarantine uh, that is required in New York. As probably you all know, New York went through, went through hell uh, March, April, May, and it's been relatively stable now. We're now at a point where 
This is people can go back to indoors in a restaurant with 25% capacity. Everybody's wearing a mask all the time. I think for 11 million people in such a small space, it's pretty impressive how, I guess, the trauma of the first few months has sort of, and probably a good state government, maybe more than a, uh, than a mayor, has been doing a lot of work. Interestingly, as I said, I come just back from three weeks in Belgium, where I also spent two weeks in quarantine. And by the time I was allowed out of that, the country had gotten so bad that it's now the worst in Europe and probably in the world in terms of uh, infection. So I've basically not been outdoors uh, for a month. So um, I followed all the rules back there, but they've now at a point where, which to me is very sad, this is supposed to be, because I'm from Belgium, so I feel kind of close to that. It's supposed to be the sixth, sixth richest country in the world. And they're now asking doctors and nurses that have COVID to keep working. And I, that, I find that heartbreaking. But I can talk more about what's going on in Belgium if you like. Hilda, I just want to share something personal, which is I miss seeing you on the train. Yes, yes. I have not been, the last time I went to Drexel was probably around March 8 or no later than March 12th for sure. And I have not been back and I'm assuming I'm teaching winter term, but I will prob that will be remote too. So I'm not going to be back until maybe more than a year after I left, which is more beyond, beyond uh, surreal. Yes. It's I think true. of those many spaces, the, the train platform and the Amtrak train, and of course the, the university and those many places where we uh, took uh, talking with colleagues on a daily basis, absolutely for granted. And now they feel, uh, and I know many people are using those spaces. They don't have the privilege I do to, to remain home and work from home. But um, yeah, I've missed seeing you on the train. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you got on half when my, I was halfway through, you would pop on. Unbelievable. Well, um, thanks to all of you for making time to talk today. And I think you each have a really interesting uh, perspective to share. And Aram, I'm going to start with you. So our conversation today is not about isolation. So, so it's not about talking about people who've experienced COVID-19 and were isolated for that. We're talking about quarantine, particularly in the context of uh, going across international boundaries or boundaries within a country in which the state has mandated a period of quarantine to avoid spreading infection. And with that as a background, Aram, could, could you tell us your story, please? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm actually originally from South Korea. My family lives there, but I teach in Chengdu, China. And so after fall semester ended uh, earlier this year in January, uh, I flew from Chengdu to South Korea to see my family. And it was the very, very early days days of COVID, even in China. So I did hear about like some, some disease that originated in a fish market in Wuhan, but I didn't really pay much attention. And so I went to Korea, um, but in late January, COVID cases started spiking in China and even started to appear in, in South Korea as well. Um, and then in early February, Chengdu was seeing some of the highest numbers of COVID cases. Um, so on like February 4th, there were 87 cases in Chengdu alone, 282 in Sichuan province um, in general. And I heard from my uh, colleagues at my university who were staying in Chengdu that the Chinese government had started imposing very, very strict measures to control the pandemic. So for example, only one person could leave uh, their home every other day. So even if you're you know, a four member family, only one person could leave every other day. And there was actually a stamp card that you had to show to uh, the guard at your apartment. And people were required to show that uh, QR code and health report whenever they enter public spaces. And the faculty at my university were required to update the HR staff with their uh, health report every day. And so given what I was hearing, I was not really in a huge rush to uh, return back to Chengdu. And even my HR staff agreed that I should just wait until the pandemic settled down. But on March 26, the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs decided to uh, suspend completely entry into China by foreign nationals uh, who were even holding valid work and residency visas. And that was effective March 28th. And I still remember my dean frantically emailing me asking if I could fly back 
immediately. And so I grabbed my passport and opened the Air China app on my phone, but there were no flights at all that were entering China from South Korea because of you know COVID and all flights were canceled. And so I was kind of stuck in Korea for a uh, spring semester, which was not terrible. I mean, I got to spend time with my family and I'm sure Yeonsil will talk more about it later, but Korea was never you know, locked down. We could work from home and you know, go to places as long as we practice safety. And so I just had to you know, kind of wait it out until I was allowed to re-enter China. Mm -hmm. And that was really, I guess, one of the most difficult things, the uncertainty of having to wait and wait and wait. And finally, in late July, um, the Chinese, uh, the Korean ambassador to China announced that Korean nationals with valid working and residency visas would be allowed to re-enter China again. And so I thought, yay, my troubles are over. But then I had uh, the other challenges of trying to apply for the re-entry visa and, uh, and also purchasing a flight ticket. So I spent like the first days of August just frantically like like checking and refresh, refreshing the Chinese embassy's webpage, going to the visa center, filling applications out. And I had so many questions, but even the staff at the visa center couldn't give me any answers because they all said, well, we don't really know anything for sure. This is all new for us too. So there was just so much uncertainty. And then after I received my new entry visa and passport, I had that challenge of booking a flight back to China. And that was really difficult because in August, there was one or at most two or three flights entering China from Korea. And that wasn't even into Chengdu, my city. It was like Shanghai or Beijing or just random cities. Wow. And so many people were trying to return. Um, there were Chinese nationals who were stuck in Korea. There were Koreans who were working and studying in China. And there were also people from the States and Europe who wanted to uh, go to China en route to Korea. So because of you know, the scarcity of flights and so many people trying to return, what happened was flights were completely, just completely sold out until like the end of November. And I had spent days calling airline companies and they all told me, oh, it's sold out, sold out. And so I kind of found this quarantine, I guess, grapevine through internet cafes, internet online communities where um, it's like there's this uh, neighbor online community with neighbor is kind of like a Korean search engine like Yahoo. So there are all these people gathered together to share information mm -hmm. on how to obtain a flight ticket. And so after hours of research, I got the number of a small private Chinese travel agent. And so what had happened was because of COVID and the scarcity of flights, um, Travel agencies from China were selling tickets at a hefty premium. And I learned that there were very few tickets uh, left for purchase. And so I found this travel agent um, who were, you know, profiting over desperate travelers. Mm -hmm. And I spent hours talking to her and also confirming that she wasn't running some kind of scam. And I purchased a one-way ticket from uh, Incheon Airport to Shenzhen Airport for a little over 3,000 US dollars, which is 10 times the usual wow. price I would pay. Usually it's just like a one-way ticket would be like yeah. 300 US dollars. Right. But I had to return because uh, my dean had announced that we would start in class, you know, teaching starting fall semester. My work is there, all my stuff, my money is here. And so um, I do feel very, very privileged that I had the funds to uh, purchase that expensive ticket. And I know that it's, it would be very, very stressful emotionally and financially, especially for junior academics with you know, limited funds. Um, luckily, my university has agreed to reimburse uh, the ticket for me. And also, um, unfortunately, right now, the situation is, is a lot better. There are much more flights open and the prices have really dropped uh, dramatically. And so uh, four days before my departure, I went to the local hospital in Korea. I got a COVID test, which was negative, of course. And I got this confirmation letter in Korean and English. And on August 21st, I boarded the plane. I arrived at Shenzhen around the uh, around noon. And the minute I landed on Shenzhen airport, I got another COVID test. 
Um, mm -hmm. The airport employees were very kind. They were very polite and organized. And after my test, I was asked to board on a bus who took me to the outskirts of Shenzhen to, uh, to Jinmao Garden Hotel. This is actually my invoice from the hotel. And um, I was asked to quarantine there for two weeks. And every quarantine hotel in China has their own specific rules. They're all very, very different. So for example, my room had very basic toiletries and we could ask um, for more, for extra for a fee. And the hotel staff would not clean our rooms until we had checked out after two weeks. After we checked out, they would sanitize and clean the rooms. Um, hotel guests were also not allowed to re leave the rooms until the quarantine was over. And there was always an employee who would sit in the middle of the hall with walkie talkies. So it was very strict. There, there were very strict um, restrictions. Um, and they would leave food three times outside my door. Uh, the staff would knock, leave the food and run away. And whenever I opened the door, there was this, this alarm that sounded like, like that, 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 like kind of to, sh to let the employees know that I was opening the door. So, um, yeah, that was kind of like weird. Um, uh, but unfortunately the food was really terrible. <laughs> so, um, even if I had brought like a huge supply of like granola and nuts and cereal and dried fruit and cup ramen, I needed more nourishment. And so, like I said, every hotel has different rules. My hotel did not let us order from outside restaurants, but they would let us uh, like order from like something like like Amazon or something, which is like a, which is Jingdong and Taobao here. So I ordered like a bulk of like more cup ramen and like chips and chocolates from shopping companies. And when they arrived, the staff sprayed disinfectant all over my packages and then delivered it to uh, my door. Yeah, and so after those two weeks, well, no, before those two weeks, the day before my release, um, oh, I actually left that part out where I, the minute I checked in the hotel, I got another COVID test. So by then I had three COVID tests. Yeah. And the day before I checked out, I got another COVID test. So COVID test number four. And they also gave me like, like confirmation, like letters saying that I quarantined in Shenzhen for two weeks, I'm healthy, um, I don't have COVID. And so I am um, the day of my release, I went down to the lobby, I paid a uh, little over like 500 US dollars. So that's the entire fee for room and food for two weeks. It's actually considerably much less than what other quarantine hotels charged in China. Um, and then I went to Shenzhen airport. I boarded on the plane finally to Chengdu and I got into my own apartment where I was asked to quarantine for another week. And so, yeah, it's very strict. And so, Every morning around 8 a.m., there would be um, this employee from the neighborhood health office who would come in like this weird spacesuit costume and check my temperature. And after six days, he told me that he wouldn't come anymore. And all I needed to do was get the final COVID test. So on day seven of my Chengdu quarantine, I went to uh, the local hospital. I got another COVID test and the neighborhood uh, health employee gave me this another confirmation letter saying that I had also quarantined in Chengdu for another week and I was healthy, I could go back to school and everything. And so um, you would think this is the end of my journey, yay, but actually my university also asked me to wait another week before going back mm. to the classroom. So I actually taught online for the first two weeks of fall semester because of that. Um, but yeah, even so, so after my apartment quarantine, I was actually going to shopping malls, I was getting groceries, but I still had to wait another week before entering the classroom. And that was September 18th. So that's kind of the gist of my journey from like, like January to September 18th. So three weeks in quarantine plus an additional week plus five COVID tests and $3,500 incurred. Yep. I think you've got to write that up as a as a film treatment. What an extraordinary <laughs> story! Thank you for sharing that. Well, we're, we're going to have a million questions about that as well. But let me let me bring Yansil on this uh, in on this and get her story. Thank you, Aram, for that. Yansil, that's a hard quarantine yes. saga to top. You don't have to top it, but we'd certainly like to hear what what you went through. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, so after actually Scott and I co-taught uh, a course on climate change over the summer and as far uh, uh, after that ended, after that term ended, I uh, went to spend some time with my family in Korea because I, by the end of August, I've been already uh, pretty isolated in Philadelphia for five and a half months uh, since March 5th, or since around March 15th. Uh, because I don't uh, have much families and friends around in Philadelphia having living in here for a year. Uh, and a lot, a lot of my new friends went back their home. So I don't really, I didn't really have much friends. So, um, so yeah, I went to, I arrived in uh, Seoul September 1st. And uh, that from the, at the airport, I had to go through uh, processes that I didn't experience, processes of health, uh, self-health reporting, um, and etc. Uh, if I go through that uh, steps, I first had to do the temperature check, and I had to write a self-reporting uh, health status of self. Uh, you know, you, you need to fill out the this form to report your health status, and those who are experiencing any symptoms like fever, coughing, uh, sore throat, uh, you had extra steps of health checkup. Be because I had sore throat, probably because of you know hard days of and nights of pecking, I just checked um, for health um, for additional health checkup just just out of curiosity what's happening next. <laughs> um, so I did, uh, so I, what I found is that there was actually a, a few uh, doctors waiting in at the airport just to have a quick uh, consultation. And then if indeed the infection is suspected, you can take a quarantine test right at the airport. Uh, so after that step, I had to go through uh, installing this self-quarantine app, which was used throughout my quarantine to uh, check my health status, mostly temperature check, and uh, for local health authorities to uh, have hands on my location uh, at the quarantine spot, uh, reported quarantine spot. Uh, so that was uh, installed at the airport. And then uh, the officers at the airport uh, called my family to, to, to have a ch second check of my quarantine location address and phone call, phone number all of that and then they had to they uh separated my uh actually all of the incoming uh people uh depending on their region so i uh was going to uh Gangwon province which is uh east side of seoul and then all the incoming people who are going to Gangwon province has to had to either use their own cars or wait for buses arranged by the local government so every three uh, three times a day, the bus will depart from the airport to the Gangwon province, and then they will uh, collect all the customers, and then they will uh, ship you to certain spot in the middle of Gangwon province, and from there, I was taken uh, by the city's uh, my city's health uh, officer, uh, who drove uh, ambulance to that spot. Uh, so in the middle of night, it was in the middle of night, uh, the ambulance was waiting for me. Uh, and then he sprayed disinfectants all over my body and all over my car, uh, car uh, uh, luggages. And then I was a, little, a bit of more like snatched <laughs> by the ambulance, like one of those movies. And then I was uh, shipped, literally transported to uh, my quarantine spot. So from there, I was I, I learned that the uh, entire route of incoming travelers were totally separated from those who are living in South Korea. So you are not supposed to take uh, subways. You are not supposed to take buses. Uh, you are if you are going to take a, a high speed rail, uh, you have to take the designated car so that you won't uh, mix with uh, with the others in, in South Korea. Mm. So I did a two week quarantine. Uh, actually, I think I was very priv privileged in that my had my family had a little vegetable farm uh, 10 minutes away from my actual family home. And then there was a little uh, this con livable container unit 
uh, which is often used as a farmhouse in South Korea. But then here it is used uh, to provide uh, uh, living spaces for those who lost their homes uh, due to hurricanes. Mm. So it was kind of ironic that I had to, I had to stay there. Uh, but uh, that was where I spent uh, two week quarantine. Uh, one thing I would like to mention about that uh, processes at the airport is that behind uh, what was not discussed in the newspapers and others, uh, there were a lot of people who were actually checking every step of the way. Um, so there was a uh, quarantine officer start directly coming from quarantine offices. And there were a lot of soldiers uh, who were checking every step of the way uh, about the app installations, addresses, all of the things. And also there were doctors and there were also local health officials uh, uh, who were checking my actual address and who delivered uh, food supplies uh, mm. to the quarantine location and uh, who called me or texted me if I missed any uh, temperature checks or anything. Uh, they were monitoring my locations and uh, the data that I am putting in through that web uh, app. So they were uh, literally a lot of people behind the technology, behind the system. Uh, they were actually operating all those systems very closely. So that's one thing I would like to mention about the uh, my quarantine experience. I just want to follow up on one one thing with that, Yon. So, so you were able to um, satisfy the government's concern because your family already had this small mm. house that was separate. Mm -hmm. did, mm -hmm. did that have to be um, inspected in some way? They had to verify that ahead of ahead of time, or they? Uh, mm. No, you don't have to, you know, report ahead of time. But when I re arrived at the airport, I had to submit the uh, exact location of the self quarantine if you are quarantining at home. Um, so once I reported that address, that address was sent to the, my local government office and I local see. health officer so that they can, all of a sudden, they all have my quarantine spot. Uh, for those who didn't have any uh, space, private space for quarantine, uh, government was supplying this facilities, uh, looks more like a dormitories that was uh, built and used by large corporations. It's like a dormitories or it is very much similar to the, those Olympic towns that mm -hmm. is used by athletes. Uh, they were able to use those facilities uh, with paying a bit of money and you could uh, if you're if you chose to stay in your home, uh, your family were able to move out and stay at hotel at a discounted rate. Uh, oh, so see. that that happened uh, to my uh, family friends. So yeah. So they moved home and the family moved out for yeah. two weeks. Yeah, yeah, because because those who are under quarantine cannot move anyway. But then you know your family have living to leave, so right. they move out and then do what it whatever they have to do. So okay. yeah, that was arranged. Okay, thank you for sharing that. It, it, those two stories together are extraordinary because they, <laughs> they show how the two different countries um, do approach it actually similarly, but still important differences there. Hilda, I, I don't even know how <laughs> to set up what you're about to tell us. So I'm just gonna have you tell us, except to just say, you've moved back and forth between Europe and the United States and neither trusts the other apparently. So go ahead and tell us what happened. Yes. Yes, and I have to say it's fascinating to listen to the first two stories because mine could not be more different, I think. So I maybe a uh, very quick background. I moved to the US two years ago. I live in New York. I work in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm on a visa. My husband's with me. He's not allowed to work because of the visa. Um, and so we had I had planned to go back, uh, you know, pre-COVID. I was going to go back to Belgium for a wedding, sorry, in August, but also earlier in July for something else. Blah, 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 the sort of, you know, lucky global traveler. Uh, none of that obviously was happening, but at some point I really had to go back for various things, research related, but others as well. The thing is, of course, that Belgium will always take me back because I'm a Belgian, 
my problem was that I, if I would go to Belgium, I would not be allowed back into the US. Um, but obviously my job's here, you know, I make, and so I couldn't really stay away. But then I heard that um, through, this is, you know, Belgians in the US uh, page on Facebook, that people some said, oh, you should check because, you know, if you, you go and you get a special, if you can, if your boss gives you a letter that you have to be back, you can do it. So I thought, okay, let me just try this and see if my dean writes me a letter <laughs> that she wants me back. A kind of interesting exercise in its own right. So um, then I looked up at the regulations and it said, you have to have a COVID test, you know, that shows that you're healthy before you leave. And then I had to fill out this form indicating where I would be staying when I arrived in Belgium. Now, and so I, I have no more family there and I didn't want to sort of be with, you know, tell my friends to come and stay with you because, you know, what if I catch it? Uh, so I just rented a space uh, in Antwerp. I flew into Brussels and rented an apartment for two weeks uh, in Antwerp, um, overlooking a busy street, thinking if I'm sitting there on my own, at least I can see some people walking through the street because my husband was not allowed. Well, he was allowed to come back to Belgium. He would never be allowed back into the country because he has no boss that wants him back. Right. So he had to stay back in New York. Fine. I don't mind. I can be without my husband for a couple of weeks. Um, so I went to Brussels. Now, here is the crossing border. Interesting thing, because I fly into Europe, I couldn't afford to fly straight to Brussels, which are, I don't know, six times the price I would normally pay. Uh, so I had to fly through uh, Portugal, through Lisbon. Now, here's the interesting thing. I arrived in Lisbon, so they wanted to see my COVID test. They took my temperature and then just let me pass on. Normally, if I would arrive in Brussels, I would have to go through, if I'd gone straight, I would have gone through customs. They would have wanted to see my paper and would have forced me to take a test to see, you know, and then start my quarantine. But because of Schengen, the rule within the European Union to free travel, Right, free, you know, people can go wherever they want. So I, they checked my paperwork in Lisbon, but then when I arrived in Brussels, I'm sorry, there we go, that's my camera, there we are. So when I arrived in Brussels, I arrived through the sort of European part of the airport. So I walked straight from the flights onto a train to Antwerp. And I was on the train before I realized I forgot to take my test. <laughs> So, and I didn't get any paperwork, uh, so I arrived uh, in my apartment in Antwerp um, on my own account, and I waited until very low hours, right before closing time, to go and buy some food, uh, because, you know, nobody brings you anything. And then I spent three days trying to get a test, because you can only, Belgium is not invested in testing, for some reason, compared to New York, where you can get a test for free every day if you want. Uh, so I spent three days because I didn't get that code at the airport. Eventually, I had to try through my uh, old doctor, uh, and on a, it was impossible to get a test. So eventually, my doctor said, well, use your brain, just stay indoors <laughs> and wait it out. And if you don't have a fever after two weeks, you're probably okay to go outside. And I go, okay. Nobody checked about whether I was in the apartment or not. And I told some friends, and they were going like, oh, but you'll be fine. Why don't you come out for dinner? I go, look. I don't want to be a super spreader. <laughs> I'm not coming out. So I actually stayed in, well, I had to go shopping every third day to get some food. So, but I stayed in for two weeks and then I was going to stay with a friend, which I did. But by then the situation had suddenly worsened. So Belgium had been doing bad, like everybody else, first wave. Uh, they're all two weeks later than the US. So it was March, April, May, and then all summer had been doing well. And the last three weeks, it, two weeks, it's really exponentially gone to where they're now sort of the worst affected country in Europe and possibly the world. So that meant that I sort of went to stay with my friends, but then we not didn't really leave the house either. And then uh, before I could not come back to the US unless I'd had a test. So I did find eventually at the airport, I could get tested the day before. And then I had to fill out paperwork. I had to ask my Dean to write me a letter to say she needed me back, which she did. I don't know if she really needed me back, but she did write the letter. And then I had to submit that to the American Embassy in Brussels, and then it took 24 hours for them to decide whether they agreed that I needed to come back. Wow. And they sent me a nice letter with a lot of headings yeah. saying, yes, we need you back. You can go back, but you might still get trouble at the at the border, um, at the customs. Then, so, you know, good luck, basically, that letter said. <laughs> um, and so then I got my test, I 
flew back again through Portugal. And then when I arrived uh, at the airport in New York, um, I also had to fill out for New York where I was going to stay the next two weeks. And then when I arrived in New York, um, it, it took me 20 minutes to convince them that I was not a fraud, that I was an actual. So the regular customs guy said, mm, that's weird paperwork. He, I've never seen this before. You don't have a green card. So then he took me to that, you know, where they take all the whatever people that they think are frauds. And it took me 20 minutes to convince them because they thought it was very, everything was very weird. Why do you live in New York when you work in Philly? Why right? blah, blah, blah. And then so apparently, I think eventually I managed to convince him because the the customs guy used to live in Harlem and I could really tell him everything about Harlem where I lived. And I think more than anything that convinced him. So then I came home and now I'm quarantining for two weeks. I did get, I do seem to get every other day a text message from the sheriff of New York, the automated thing, of course, asking me, do you know you have to stay in your apartment for two weeks? So that's what I'm doing now. And what day are you on of that? I arrived Friday night, so it's it's until it's until the Friday after the election. Wow. Okay. So can I jump yeah. in for just a quick okay. minute? I actually arrived through through JFK, and then I came straight to Philadelphia. So I was very curious what's going to happen to me. I knew New York State uh, applied two week quarantine, but how about those who entering and going straight out of uh, the state? And it turns out that I don't really have to report anything. Uh, I just followed the Pennsylvania Pennsylvania rule. So I didn't have any uh, two-week quarantine. Oh, that's good. So I know that in Europe, if you just travel through the country, and some countries is 48 hours, other countries is 24, you don't have to do anything. So if you're just in transit or just stay there for a day, which is also weird, right? Because then you don't have to do anything, but you can still be carrying it. So, yeah. I, I, I Rarely am I speechless on COVID calls, but I have to say this is what an extraordinary uh, collection of of experiences and stories and thinking about them in comparison is really illuminating. I, I guess I, I have a question for each of you and Aram, I wanna ask you first about this. Uh, you talked about um, get, getting food from outside and and that's a way not only for nourishment, but to cope with being there alone. I, could you talk a little bit, I'd like to hear from each of you about sort of highs and lows of the experience not not only in the quarantine period, but also each of you have described pretty harrowing border crossing situations, which are already stressful situations for people, even frequent travelers still get that tinge when you're crossing borders and filling out those declarations. I'd like to hear a little bit about the sort of psychological impact of it. Aram, would you mind starting? Yeah, um, so, so during my two week quarantine in Shenzhen, I would say there were some moments where I felt desperately lonely because I was this Shenzhen was a city I never visited before. It was, you know, a strange city. I was in some strange hotel and it's kind of like a very, very old holiday inn. So it wasn't even really in very good condition. Um, and there was this weird smell that, you know, reeked from like pillowcases and, and old curtains. And luckily I had brought like extra pillowcases. Lesson for anybody who's going to quarantine in China, bring extra everything, like bring extra clothes, bring extra pajamas, pillowcases, um, bring a blanket or whatever, just bring everything. Um, I even brought my own like laundry soap. Um, so I was like, there was moments when I was like desperately lonely. I had like basically no human contact for two weeks. Um, because even the staff would just leave my food at the door and run away. Um, but still there was, um, we still had like a designated chat room for all the quarantined hotel oh. guests. So we could kind of like discuss and converse what was going on. We could like exchange a bit of information and you know ask each other like, oh, like if you're going to the airport, like what bus are you gonna take? And so there was you know some contact and discussion online, which was really helpful. Um, and luckily the Wi-Fi was was very strong. I think that was that's one of the most important things. So I was able to communicate with my friends and family and also my colleagues and my HR staff. And my HR staff was was really, really helpful. They always checked in to uh, make sure that I needed something. Um, 
And so I actually even purchased, with the help of my HR staff, a very, very small, like mini stepper so I could exercise in my uh -huh. hotel room. It was like a little over 30 US dollars. So I just, you know, invested in it. And I actually used it very well because I couldn't go anywhere and, you know, I couldn't just walk around the hotel room all the time. So, um, yeah, I think all those, you know, uh, the help that I received from my family and friends and my staff that really helped coping with the loneliness. Um, yeah. And, and I also got through two seasons of uh, Schitt's Creek. So yeah. I <laughs> and and the, the yeah. chat, the chat room was for people in quarantine in that hotel. So it was like a closed circuit sort of chat experience. Yes. It was actually for the people on my floor, the fourth floor. So it was wow. just a chat room for the fourth floor uh, quarantine guests. I guess every floor has different quarantine guests who came in at different times. So on my floor, we all came in on August 21st, and we were all going to be released on September 4th. So we could kind of exchange information on what's going on. And also the hotel employee would uh, give us like in advance what the menus would be for the next day. Although I couldn't really eat most of it, but yeah, she was very nice. And, you know, she gave us information. Well, this is going to be the feast for the next day. And I'm like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make friends? Um, unfortunately, no, because I couldn't meet anyone technically. Right. We could just, yeah, converse through chat. And yeah. then we left the hotel without seeing anybody. So yeah, technically so we right. couldn't really make friends like face to face. Right. Uh, Yansel, same question to you. Can you tell us a little of the highs and lows, just how you coped? Uh, yeah, uh, strangely, because I was pretty much isolated already in Philadelphia, um, I felt more not isolated during my quarantine because I had uh, my family visiting every day, uh, even though they were, they didn't come inside the container unit I was living, uh, they were staying a few meters, few feet away from me, and then they had set up outside tables out over there, uh, camping tents over there. Uh, they stayed, uh, they delivered food. Um, and they. Uh, my family also had a little garden, vegetable garden over there. So I had pleasure of picking fresh vegetables out there and then doing exercises. So in fact, I got a lot tanned uh, during my quarantine because I spent a lot of time outside, uh, which is strange. I said quarantine experience for me. So it's it's kind of, in a way, quarantine period was much more uh, not isolated for me because I was already, you know, uh, pretty uh, isolated in Philadelphia. Uh, so that kind of gives you a lot of idea of, you know, what it's like to under uh, pandemic for those who are away from uh, their families and friends. It's uh, it is living under quarantine in a, in a sense, you know, you, I, you, my daily routine had been, you know, going out for a uh, supermarket, uh, CVS uh, uh, every day or every other day, uh, just to pick up some groceries and then just to take a walk or doing some exercise. So that was pretty much it. And that is pretty much like Hilda's, you know, quarantine in Belgium. So yeah, so that's a strange way that, was my quarantine experience. And thanks to my father, he had everything uh, sorted out from TV, wireless, uh, everything over there. So I had no issue working, uh, spending time there. It's really interesting. And, and what a perspective that your experience in Philadelphia, because you're living, in a sense, living abroad, working abroad um, from, your, from your home country, that you experienced greater isolation, not under quarantine than you did under quarantine, even though you were separate, but you were there on family land, the way you're describing the garden. There seemed to have been some comfort there, even though you were under quarantine. Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I always hoped, I always liked to have vegetable uh, a garden. I always like to, even though there is nothing to pick, uh, I just always like to have a walk and watch them growing. And mm -hmm. I, I wish to have have a little land over here in Philadelphia just to you know spend some time outside gardening. Uh, that is some of that is why I 
spent so much money buying plants <laughs> and <laughs> throw them out when they are dying, buying flowers. Uh, so it was comforting in a way um, to be at that you know, familiar environment and to have conversations with actual people around me, even though they were not close to me physically. Hilda, I know you to be a pretty gregarious person um, and so these many weeks of isolation, can you talk about what it's been like for you? Yeah, well, it's interesting that Jan Sil says because uh, living in New York, we've only lived here for two years and we've made friends, but half of our friends here have also left. So we have one friend here, a couple that don't feel safe in New York, so they rented a farm in Connecticut where they've been for months now. We've had another friend who's moved back to wherever. So we've been, our group has become pretty small in New York as it is, and we've really also been inside a lot. So in that sense, it wasn't extremely different from what I've been doing mostly, uh, I guess, uh, for a long time in New York, although in summer you could go out more, et cetera, et cetera. So that was kind of okay. I also had this thing that I knew that if I could keep it up for two weeks, um, that I would see a lot of friends that I hadn't seen in a long time. That ended up not happening because, you know, the last week turned out, the, oops, sorry, turned out that, uh, you know, that things had gotten so bad. But that was kind of something. So I managed that. I watched television, which I don't do a lot here. I, so I did all that stupid stuff, um, the sort of faster time and sort of Zooms with people. So that was okay. I think to, in my case, there was this sort of, one step after the other kind of anxiety first i spend and i'm not an anxious person as such but you know i'm not good with admin and I'm, and as you said even you know at the end particularly the moment you just see and this is in the us maybe more than anywhere else but if you see the custom person you always feel you're guilty i would think i'm you know i i probably look like i'm carrying drugs because i just feel so uncomfortable when you see them and i think so that was kind of so first i spent three days trying to figure out how to get a test and this is more border stuff because and I haven't told that before, but it was kind of interesting because in Belgium, it's a federal state, but sort of, you know, it started up as one country and then became federalized. So the different regions don't particularly like each other and they fight a lot over it. So I was staying in quarantine in Antwerp, but my doctor was in Brussels, so he could only give me a test in Brussels. But then I would have, as a potential super spreader, have to take a train to Brussels to get my test. And so there was more border crossing happening there that I thought, like, forget it, right? So, and then after three days, I thought, I'm just going to stop worrying about this. And then I knew I had to try and get, you know, the American embassy to say, okay, you can come back, right? I knew my dean would write me the letter, but I didn't know if the American, so, that, and I decided I'm not going to worry about that for the first 10 days. So day 10, I go, like, okay, let me submit this to the embassy. And then you had to wait until they said, okay. And then, then I was good for a while. And then I thought, like, now I need to make sure I do actually get back into the country. So it was more of those sort of, you feel, and I love travel, and I used to travel a lot for work and not for work, and and I was, it's, oh my God, I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure I want to go through this again, I, you know, yeah. until maybe I'd rather just not travel anymore until we're back to something slightly more, I think we're never going to go back to what, what was there, but yeah. the amount of sort of paperwork and red tape even though at the same time I was in a country where it was all sort of you know personal responsibility. I could have just gone out. I could have gone to restaurants every day and nobody would have been the wiser, right? And you know, because I remember also when I arrived, um, I was terribly hungry. And I thought, let me on my way to this uh, apartment, let me just stop here in a place and buy something to eat here and now because I'm really starving. And when you walk into a shop, you had to give your name and a telephone number so that in case you know, that they can trace you. This is part of the tracing. And I was going to put, put down my name, and I thought that the person before me had put down the name of one of the seven ministers of health. This is all these governments in Belgium. The name of one of the health ministers and the number that was never a phone number. So I go like, okay, this is the kind of people we're dealing with here. Nobody's taking yeah, this yeah. business. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of person, and, and I thought like, I'm not usually, I'm like a, not like a germaphobe or anything, I think maybe these months in the seriousness in New York has made me more serious than I felt. I'm not entirely surprised that that country is not doing so well. So I think the solitude was not too bad. You know, I was happy to be back with my husband when I finally got here, but it's all this sort of extra red tape and this kind of anxiety. I don't like that word, but that comes with it. That to me, 
was kind of tiresome. Yes. Let me ask a, a question because each of the three of you are, are writers. Uh, I think maybe many people have the idea that uh, in our line of work, if I could just have two weeks um, <laughs> where I could be alone and finally I get some writing done, would you like to tell us, dispel us of that notion or would you like to tell us that there was some creativity that worked through in that time, some unexpected um, insights that came from this enforced moment of, of quarantine isolation. Aram, can I, I'm putting you on the spot with this question. If you prefer not to answer, it's okay, but I am, I'm curious. No, it's fine. Um, I actually did get some writing done because I had um, a journal article due on August 31st. So there was this deadline that forced me to write, although I didn't you know, feel like writing in that dodgy hotel room. So, so yeah, I actually did uh, finish that article and I did submit it's currently under review. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was two weeks of writing, coffee, uh, Schitt's Creek, uh, more writing and then like Selling Sunset. Like, so yeah, just writing and Netflix and writing and Netflix. So, um, and I also actually brought a couple of novels to read. And so I also kind of did catch up on my reading. I think uh, in a way it was kind of productive because I was just forced to be in a room for two weeks. I couldn't go out. I couldn't do anything else. So, um, yeah, I listened to a lot of music, saw a lot of you know TV shows, got some writing done. So, uh, despite the loneliness and the uncertainty, I actually got some work done. So, yeah, that was good. And you, I mean, in your case, you really couldn't leave. I really I mean, couldn't leave. <laughs> yeah, if I opened the door, there would be this beep, beep, yeah. beep sound, and yeah. everybody would know. The employees would know, yeah. and they would go on their walkie talkies like, like, you know, oh, room 404 is like out of control or yeah. something. So, She's, 404 yeah. is not working on her article. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's amazing. I don't know, Jansil or Hilda, would you like to answer this question? You don't have to if you don't want to, but I am fascinated by these sort of enforced, isolated moments. I think I, I spent the first few days struggling to focus also part because of jet lag and you're sort of weirdly tired and i you know so i had that and that's i had the same when the lockdown started at home in in march i really took a while to be able to focus some because there's so i don't know what it is but that was difficult and after that i spent a lot of time doing part conversations with everyone so my working hours were from three in the afternoon until 11 in the evening <laughs> because and then because you know that's what that were the Philly hours basically. Mm -hmm. Um, but then once I found some more balance, I did I did get some writing done, not clearly not like our room. <laughs> you had a very yeah, you're very productive. <laughs> I was that level of I had that level of productivity. But as I say, I did get a lot of work done because what else are you gonna do, right? But I didn't feel because I, I didn't feel particularly focused enough to do definitely not my best writing. I, I did write a bit, but no, yeah, interesting, right? As, as you said, you think like, yes, this is it, woman, two weeks to just, you know, focus, nobody bothering you, you can, you know, you, you can just write and no, no, that that, that book chapter didn't happen. <laughs> Yonsel, what was your experience of having two yeah, weeks? Certainly not as much as Aram, but I did also uh, done some writing and researching done and partially because I had some deadlines uh, partially because I'm free of all the chores that I had to do, uh, especially regarding the food preparation. I got my mother and father delivering and my brothers and cousins uh, delivering food all the time. So I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time cooking. Uh, uh, so that saved me a lot of energy. Although I enjoy cooking, uh, that certainly get, takes away a lot, like every uh, few hours a day. So. That does not mean I worked a few hours more uh, every day, but it certainly, I felt uh, that free of any housework chores, doing gro groceries uh, saved me a lot of energy. And uh, yeah, I think I was okay <laughs> with working because I pretty much because I had to, I, I was able to, you know, lie down on the grass for a while and then do some writing out, outside. I actually had some photographs uh of me doing but <laughs> it was more like vacation uh it, it was more like a writing treat retreat uh sort of in a way i the perspective you're each sharing too i mean you there were work considerations um for each of you i mean you're 
productivity you've just been talking about and the need to get back or cross international boundaries to get back to your work. Um, and I, I'd be interested to compare that with um, stories of people who, who went into quarantine and, and they were not able to work in that time. In other words, people who maybe work in hospitality industry or in some where they pay, they literally are not on a salary and, and being in the quarantine kept them from, from earning money. I, I guess, of course, you're not able to share those stories with people. I don't know, Aram, in your fourth floor chat, maybe people shared some perspective of what it was like. Did anybody tell their stories along those lines? Were they suffering economic privation as well as privation of company? Well, we actually didn't really share, you know, personal stories in that chat room. I think uh, most of the content we discussed was just information about uh, like food or basic toiletries in the hotel room or like where to get, you know, some kind of supplies from some kind of, you know, shopping mall. Um, so most of the discussions we had was basically about just just daily survival, like how to get on, you know, the day and like what we need for the next day and so so on. Well, we're almost up on time, and um, I, there was, I guess, the the last question I I had is sort of a broad question for each of you, which is, um, you know, did you feel through the process that it was being ex? Did you understand it? Was it comprehensible? Was it being explained? Was the rationale being explained? I mean, you've each told such different stories. But I am sort of curious as we look back on this time, the degree to which those actions track back to some sort of comprehensive explanation, because we're moving again in many countries, certainly in the United States and in Belgium, we're moving back into this period with no real end in sight, so far as I can tell. So people may be passing in and out of quarantine periods, and I think it does really show the, the need to have a clear sort of comprehensive argument as to why you would or would not take these kind of steps. I mean, Aram, when you were talking, I was thinking in the United States, if you told people that's what they were going to go through, what we have seen. I mean, many people in the United States are not even willing to wear a mask at this time. So they would not be willing to undergo that kind of quarantine. Did you feel like it was well explained? Let me just give everybody a chance to answer this as we as we round out the discussion. Um, yes, I think it was very well explained. There was always an employee who would uh, guide us step by step and explain what they were going to do and what we had to follow. Um, I, I do know that in, in some cases, these can be viewed as very, very strict restrictions, very strict control. But in a way, I think because of these strict restrictions, um, the number of COVID cases have really dropped here in China. Although I did hear about some cases in, in Xinjiang the other day. So I don't think, I mean, even in China, we know that we're not totally you know, clear yet. Everybody's still very careful. The HR staff always cautions us to wear a mask in the classroom. They ask us not to go to places that are too crowded. And so um, I think most of the people do understand why such restrictive measures are taking place and why we need to uh, follow those measures and why those are actually effective. Hilda, let me turn the same question to you. I mean... Yes, I think it's fair. It's been, to me, it's been fascinating because I feel like I'm sort of a bit of an observer still in, in the US. I've only been here two years, but I also feel much of a, like an observer, observing what's happening in my home country. And I think one of the things is that if, you know, if Brexit happened because they thought that it was too much homogenization through the European Union, it's been amazing to see in Europe how every <laughs> country has reacted completely different. Right, there's yeah. times where there was lockdown in Belgium with people just take the car and go for a drink in France or in the Netherlands just across the border because there the rules were different. I think in Belgium you could see that they, the government has followed experts. That's good, right? It's, it's not very politicized, but they've been very, it's always politicized, of course, because they take the advice of the experts and then there's also political level about are we going to shut down restaurants? What's the economic impact? They've been following it very carefully so that almost from week to week, 
compared to prints in New York, where it's the same for months, the rules, almost from week to week, rules would change. You can have a bubble of six people, you can have a bubble of eight people. Now we go back to having a bubble of four people. You have to bring a mask along on the street and wear it if the street is busy. You have to wear it all the time, or maybe you don't. And I think that that has been detrimental in a sense. So when I got on the flight to Belgium, I was still told two weeks quarantine. In a sense, when I arrived, they had just changed. So within those <laughs> 10 hours travel, it had changed to, well, maybe just one week. But by the time that week was over, it was getting worse. So we we're back to two weeks. And so I think, well, mm. it's going to be, it's not that they're just making it up, right? They take a lot of advice, but they're trying to be working with sort of personal responsibility combined with, let's just see what, what the science tells us from week to week, that nobody ends up really knowing what's what anymore and I thought that was that was pretty that was to me was super and also how it differs so much between countries and at this point it's different if you live in Brussels in the French speaking part or in the Flemish speaking part what you can and cannot do even to the extent of whether you can go out and play with your sports team or not so that to me well interesting but also a little crazy I, it, I mean it really strikes me in the variability you've seen you saw between you know Portugal Belgium but then within you know, subnational level in Belgium, but then also in the greater New York metro that, you know, the, the mayor of New York was telling people, don't go to Jersey if you don't have to. And, and you know, they know they can't really enforce a New Jersey quarantine, but they would like to, um, yeah. and not to mention Pennsylvania. Jan, so I'm gonna give you the last last word on this this question. Yes, um, so I, like Hilda, myself has been distanced, uh, distant from American society as well as Korean society uh, physically and you know uh, so I've been I've been observer for two countries as well and then what I found was striking about uh, when I compare Korea and uh, United States in their response is that Korea had been quite consistent about the rules and they didn't really uh, change a bit um, it has been pretty simple and straightforward for pretty much everybody. So basic rule is wear the mask. Uh, you can eat inside, but while you're not eating, you can you need to wear masks. And then uh, schools has been closed, things like the very simple, straightforward rules. And Korea have never locked uh, the society down. It was restaurants, cafes has, have been always open. Uh, 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 when I arrived in South Korea, the number of cases spiked up uh, for a while. And then that was when additional uh, restrictions were applied. So no more than, uh, was it 20? No more than certain number of people were were supposed to gather. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time that that kind of rule was applied. Uh, again, like private uh, private level of gathering. So unlike America, like 25% of occupants, 50% of occupants, you uh, in, in England, in UK, in the UK, I saw some rules were like more than 10 people are not allowed and then suddenly it became 25. There was no such thing in South Korea. So it had been pretty straightforward. And another thing is that uh, national uh, public health, uh, I, I forgot the official name, but national agency in charge of this quarantine management did daily briefing, which was also very straightforward. I think that explained a lot to the people uh, about what, what uh, about all the policies that, that were put in place. Um, so yeah, that has been my observation uh, coming back and forth between two countries. Well, I wanna thank each of you for taking time to explain uh, what you've been through and remind everybody that you can catch COVID calls every weekday at 5 p.m. tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about COVID-19 and the digital divide in the United States with Blair Levin from the Brookings Institution. Look forward to that we'll see you then. And until then, um, Jansel and Hilda, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing your perspectives and Aram as you as, you as well. And thank you for getting up uh, so very early <laughs> as well to share that and stay healthy everyone. We appreciate your time today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See you tomorrow, everybody, five o'clock.